This one's all up or decorated. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do still in our house too before the new year kicks off. But as you, as you heard me tell the kids, Epiphany is traditionally the celebration of the end of the holidays. This would happen on January 6th with large feasts and people would give gifts to commemorate the gifts that the wise men brought to baby Jesus. That's where the whole Christmas gift giving tradition began, but we just get it started a little bit earlier these days than they originally had planned. There's a second definition of the word epiphany that some of you may be familiar with. An epiphany is a moment in which you suddenly see or understand something in a new or very clear way. And that is my hope and my wish for us as individuals and as a congregation this morning and throughout the new year that we may boldly risk seeing things in a new and more clear way as we move throughout this year together. Now, some of you may know more about the wise men than me, but the word wise men has been translated from the Greek magi, or magi, which is the same word that we take our modern word magician from. So the carol which says we three kings is a little bit off. Most modern theologians agree that these were people from Persia, from the land of Persia, and they may have been living in the royal houses as dream interpreters or Zoroastrian priests. These people had, they watched the stars in a kind of scientific way like astronomers, but they also tried to gain meaning from what they saw in the heavens, kind of like astrologers. So these weren't exactly kings, they were part of the royal household, but they had a, a strange role, an in-between role, um, between different ideas. Now these people traveled what was probably a thousand miles from Persia to the town of Bethlehem, and back in those days it would have taken about, about three to six months. So there are a lot of discussions and debates about how this actually happened. Did the star show up three to six months early so that the wise men could make it to the stable? Or did it come that night and the wise men came three to six months later or even longer? Herod's decree in verse 15 and 16 of this chapter of Matthew um, says that he called for the death of all the Jewish baby boys in Bethlehem who were two years old and under, which gives us the idea that maybe a little more time had passed and maybe the wise men didn't make it to the stable on that holy night. Also, if you look at our text from today in verse 11, it says that they visited Mary and Joseph in the house, not in the stable. Because Jewish custom was that the family would remain in the father's home until they had enough money to buy their own place. So likely Mary and Joseph were staying with Joseph's parents when these visitors from the east, perhaps men and women, perhaps three, perhaps more, um, perhaps less, we don't really know, there aren't hard evidence or facts about these people. But around the 1500s, there were a lot of legends and traditions created about this special occasion, and we came up with the names, Balthazar, Gaspar, and Melchior, and the idea that they were kings, but there's really no evidence of that. What I like most about this section is verse 10 from this translation of the Message Bible. They were in the right place, and they had arrived at the right time. So for me, theirs is the perfect message, New Year's message for us today. I invite you to take a moment to think back over the past year. In 2015, how often did you find yourself in the wrong place or with bad timing? I know this week as I was thinking back over the past year, I could think of plenty of occasions that I wish I could say or do something differently than I did in the previous year that I wish that I could take something back, that I could have a do-over. I don't know if that resonates with you at all, but as I was thinking through the year, I also could recall a few moments when I felt like I was in the right place at the right time. And if you've had a moment like that, you know that it feels very sweet and holy or serendipitous, that it's encouraging and that it's full of joy. In this um, chapter, in verse 11, it says that the men were overcome and in another version it says, overcome with joy as they kneeled at the foot of the baby king. So I thought about that hymn that we sang first this morning, God rest you Mary, gentlemen, and about the tidings of comfort and joy, and that's what I would wish for you and your families for this year, comfort <clears throat> and joy. But the more I studied this song, I found out that it means a lot more than we actually think because we don't speak the language anymore of which it was written. You see, the author is unknown, but this 
carol is thought to have been composed in the 1400s. That was a time in the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, when church music was very dark and sombre, and everything that happened inside the cathedrals was in Latin. And so a lot of the English peasants made up their own music to sing about the things they learned in church in a more joyful and inspiring way as they went about their daily chores in the house or in the fields. So this little song, God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, is actually a quiet rebellion. It's a quiet song that was created by peasants to remember the joy and the inspiration in the Christmas story. But it wasn't published until the 18th century. And so we sometimes lose meaning over time. If we look back, the word merry does not mean joyful or happy. Think of Robin Hood's merry men. The word merry in that time actually meant great or mighty. And the word rest was not a verb like we think to take a nap, but to take a break. It actually meant to make or to keep. God rest ye merry, comma, gentlemen, means that we aren't describing the gentlemen as merry or happy men. We're saying, God get, make you mighty, gentlemen. God make us mighty or great, ladies and gentlemen. That's the actual meaning of that song, which I had never really thought about before when I started to study it. So thinking about New Year's resolutions, whether you do them or whether you're opposed to them, I know people have strong feelings this time of year. This is the best idea that I can offer us for the new calendar year. May God make us mighty, ladies and gentlemen, because with all of the brokenness and heartache, evil and depravity in our world and in our country and in our state, our town, and even within our own homes, my prayer for us all this Epiphany Sunday is that God make us mighty and great and that we may see God more clearly and in a new and different way. For Matthew's story tells us that God spoke to priests of a foreign religion in a distant land in exactly the way that they needed to hear it in order to understand that something important was happening. God went to them in their language, in their comfort zone, and invited them into the fold of God's love and plan for the salvation and beauty of the entire world. This morning, God wants us to broaden our horizons to open our minds, to never fear sharing the love and hope and peace and joy of God with every single person we meet, no matter their outcome or their station in life, no matter where they're from or where they're headed. Like the Egyptians who welcomed the baby refugee Jesus, we are called to open our hearts and our homes for, to protect those in danger, to provide safe shelter, for people in need. You see, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, they went to Africa with their little baby to be protected from Herod's slaughter of the innocent. They went into the heart of Africa to be embraced by Mother Africa and to be kept safe for maybe a few weeks, maybe a few years. Scholars debate that point as well. But it's interesting during this time of year, during this global refugee crisis, to think about all the people coming out of Africa and out of the Middle East looking for hope and a new start. And the beginnings of our faith tell us that Jesus, perhaps he even used, they even used the gifts that the wise men bought and brought to pay their passage to Africa to be safe before returning back home. You know, I heard Chancellor Angela Merkel's New Year's Eve speech this year, and she warmly thanked the German people for welcoming over one million refugees to their country in this year, far more than any other country on the face of the planet. And she said this wave of immigrants will, quote, demand much of us in terms of time, energy, and money. But in the end of her speech, she said that Germany is a strong nation, and what others call a crisis, she sees differently. She sees as an opportunity for solidarity, for people to come together and to fight for what is right, for hope and a better future for everyone, and also an opportunity for growth in a country where growth has stagnated for many years. As we think back over the year that has just ended, and as we look ahead to the year that lies before us, just waiting to be unraveled, may we not be pushed down or snuffed out 
by all of the darkness which certainly surrounds us. May God give us wisdom and vision to see things in a new and more clear way. Let us welcome the stranger, make visits and bring gifts to others, and let our hope light shine. May we allow the love of God to wipe away our tears and our pains and our burdens just like that old camel, just like those wise visitors from the east. And may we be invited into a more stunning life dance with the Holy Spirit who is present in us and among us and within us every moment of our lives. And even if they are fleeting, I pray that we may all have moments where we, like the Magi, are literally overwhelmed with joy this coming year. Happy New Year. <laughs>